Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the fa Faculty of Law, I warmly welcome all of you to the 14th International Research Conference of General Sir John with the Lavender Defence University. We feel honoured to have President's Council K. Kanagiswaran, Dean, Faculty of Law, Mr. Mangala Vijay Singha, paper presenters, and all the distinguished guests and participants here at this session based on the theme of novel trends emanating from the new normal and legal response by the corporate sector. Now, I would like to give a brief introduction to President's Counsel K. Kanagiswaran, the Honorable Chairperson of the current session. President's Counsel K. Kanagiswaran graduated with an LLB degree from the University of London. He was called to the bar at Lincoln's Inn in June 1964. He was called to the bar in Ceylon in July 1966 and became an advocate of the Supreme Court. President's Counsel Kanagiswaran was a member of the Law Commission of Sri Lanka from 1994 to 2009, Director of the Law and Society Trust, Institute for the Development of Commercial Law and Practice, Arbitration Centre Colombo, and a Chairman of a number of committees advising on new legislation. He had also been a member of the Council of the University of Colombo. In 2014, President's Council Kanagiswaran co-authored a book on company law. Now, I would like to cordially invite the Honourable Chairperson to begin the session. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, we can hear. Yeah, can you hear me? Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am deeply honored to have been invited to chair this session, technical session number two. The caption, the title being novel, novel trends emanating from the new normal and legal response by the corporate sector. Now, the program is so finely tuned, I might say, as lawyers say, time is of the essence. And um, we have for you research presentation from five persons on very exciting topics. And um, I'm told of the five presentations, two of the presentations will not be done in person as they are uh, writing an exam right now. And they will be pre-recorded video presentations. Now, the presentation, each presentation uh, time-wise will be given about 10 minutes each. And if they enter the five presentations, we have a question Q&A session, which is also about 15 odd, odd minutes. So without much ado, I would uh, go straight away to introducing the first presentation research paper. The caption, the role of business in achieving sustainable development goals amid the COVID-19 pandemic, the legal perspective. Matter of fact, I was given a short abstract of all these papers. I must say they are very exciting presentation. I'm sure you are going to enjoy it. Now, the first presentation is going to be done by Ms. Avani Sasanka Samarakon. It's been co-authored by three, but since we have limited time with regard to introductions and things like that. I have chosen to introduce the speaker who is going to present it, Ms. Avani Sasanka Samarakon, an LLB graduate of the, of the, of the uh, university and is currently studying in the final year at the Sri Lanka Law College and also reading for her Master's in Law in International Law at the Cardiff Metropolitan University. Her research interests are commercial law, criminal law and labor law. So may I invite Ms. Samara Kohn to make a presentation, please. Ms. Samara Kohn. Good morning, Honorable Chair, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. 
My research topic is uh, the role of business in achieving uh, sustainable development goals amid the COVID-19 pandemic related to perspectives. COVID-19 pandemic is a severely become a challenge to achieve sustainable development goals. The effect of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly in the social and financial circles in low and uh, middle income developing countries, including Sri Lanka, have been especially extreme because of uh, results like the interruption of supply chains, reduced uh, foreign rentals and FDI and others. The sustainable development goals are the diagram to accomplish a superior and more sustainable future for all. They address the worldwide difficulties, including those identified with poverty, inequality, environmental degradation, uh, environmental change, natural um, degradation, or peace and justice, peace, peace and justice. Achieving these stages in this pandemic become very difficult and challenging tasks. The research problem is whether the prevailing laws are sufficient and practicable in regulating businesses to achieve the SDGs uh, in this pandemic. The objective of this research are to identify the impact of COVID 19 to sustainable development goals, to discuss the role of business in society in achieving such goals, to analyze whether Sri Lankan laws are sufficient in steering businesses in playing their role, and to propose the necessary amendments. Here, the methodology of this research is blank data method. This research would employ quality analysis of planetary data and subsidiary data. Confirming all difficulties presented by COVID-19 pandemic, assembling a superior world and accomplishing exclusive targets can't be accomplished by any nation alone and needs common participation and organization. For Sri Lanka, supporting the worst affected sector in this area that contributed the lion offers to the economic and occupations that SMEs sell out uh, enterprises like apparel and tourism industry to bounce back this mentally yet pay the name of different nations. In such manner, common society, the scholarly world, the private sector, international financial intelligence, and regional organizations can make an important commitment towards the accomplishment of the 2030 development agenda by activating activity, giving ability, and monetary assets. On one hand, both self-employed people and the people who depend on daily wages are severely affected as they have lost their sources of income. On the other hand, it resulted in reduction of buying power of the consumers, causing reduction in demands for goods and services. As a result, sales and profits have gone down by considerable margins of uh, majority of businesses, starting from large companies to small and medium enterprises. Furthermore, several businesses have imposed salary cuts and layoffs on their uh, employees, which has forced many people to lose their jobs. Despite the fact that majority of industries are affected by this pandemic, there is a huge responsibility on the shoulders of the business sector in overcoming this critical situation. In the context of sustainable development, there is no single legislation that covers all the areas of sustainability. Sri Lanka as a country has enacted different legislation at times focusing on different aspects of triple bottom line concepts. For instance, some statutes govern the area of environment while others govern the area of consumer affairs and labor affairs. In Sustainable Development Act, the main piece of legislation which is enacted with the sole purpose of designing, developing, and implementing national pre-existing strategies on sustainable development and facilitating the respective stakeholders who are responsible and uh, following up the monitoring and progress. Industrial Dispute Act can be considered as one of the main legislation in the field of labor law, which provides means of uh, solving disputes between employers and employees in a fair and just manner. In order to protect consumer rights um, against businesses, it basically covers such uh, as price management, market investigation, consumer awareness, uh, etc., and ensures that consumers are protected from unfair trade practices of um, companies. In sales of good ordinance, uh, it consists of uh, provisions regarding impact conditions and warranties, which guarantees the quality of the uh, goods sold. Traffic uh, Commission uh, accepts a safeguard against anti competitive uh, business practices and the creation of non products. It protects the startup businesses and small and medium enterprises by preventing the market leaders from manipulating the market to their advantage by controlling the price and the When scrutinizing the gaps in the existing legal framework in Sri Lanka, it was evident that as a country we lack a proper legal regime to address uncertainty in governance, green economy, and within the digital world. If the SDG has been observed in an early stage, countries' response and the control of global emergencies could be more effective. 
According to SDG Goal 3, it is a uh, duty of the state to focus on early warning, reduction of risk, and managing national and global risk during the uh, emergency situation. Many states were able to identify the health risk and the necessary safety precautions uh, for the control of COVID 19 with the help of expert companies in the river field. Sri Lanka is currently like a comprehensive legal regime to get the uh, services to the private sector as well as the public sector companies, namely in terms of technology and facility, facilities in promoting this uh, pandemic. Even though uh, Sri Lanka has relatively a strong legal framework in the context of sustainable development, it is not without its flaws. In our opinion, sustainable development goal 1, which is uh, eliminating uh, poverty, is not addressed explicitly under the current legal framework. There are no proper laws uh, formulated to transfer the economic benefits that are generated uh, to businesses to society as the contribution of businesses in uh, rural and regional development is very little. It is true that uh, some companies have zero cost of USC by low materials for their production such as uh, ginger, vanilla and jaggery from uh, local farmers as per their organization levels, but the law does not incorporate any uh, similar provisions in that regard. Furthermore, the lack of a comprehensive legal framework that regulates corporate social responsibility project is a major lacuna in the uh, existing legal system. At present, the concept of CSR has become nothing but a marketing tool which companies use to induce their sales. Due to the uh, fact that the current uh, legal system does not provide any provisions to regulate CSR projects or to measure their uh, social impact and benefits. The companies tend to carry out project in the name of CSR just for the sake of promoting their products at all their needs. This again has an adverse effect on sustainability as they do not actually serve the purpose of social development or environment development. Another area that needs improvement in our opinion is the laws regulating the responsibilities of the consumers. It is often seen that laws are lawmakers with uh, high importance to consumer rights, yet the consumer responsibilities often go unrecognized uh, when promoting laws. According to the Sustainable Development Goal number 12, uh, which is responsible consumption and production, both producers and consumers are expected to be responsible, especially during the social crisis that today. Responsible behavior of the consumer is of utmost importance to overcome this crisis. For instance, the essential items such as food, food uh, should be distributed among all the consumers equally by mitigating excess consumption and wastage. Moreover, there is a huge room uh, for improvement in the implementation part. There is uh, no proper implementation mechanism in store, especially in the government sector to carry out provisions of the other settings. Accordingly, there are substantial time delays in the implementation process and in different frequencies open generalized due to this risk. Considering the above facts, the authors wish to make uh, the following recommendations uh, to the existing legal set. The legal framework should be modified as to incorporate uh, concepts like sustainable, uh, sustainable sourcing to our legal system, requiring businesses to go hands with local suppliers and farmers in obtaining raw materials for their production process. It contributes to the development of the household economics of the local suppliers and the growth of national economy. The public-private partnership model in Sri Lanka, the Brexit alliances, relocating public-private partnership model has transformed global progress by really implementing sustainable access to that is more than scale and space. A great necessity has arisen to develop a comprehensive legal framework governing as well as the exclusion safety. The necessity of the law should be introduced to regulate the businesses to contribute to the regional and legal development by creating the opportunities. It will provide a solution to the issue of unemployment. The due importance and recognition should be given to person responsibilities by formulating necessary laws to regulate the behavior of the consumers. For instance, maximum limits of quantities can be imposed for the purchase of essential items. More importantly, an effective and efficient uh, implementation mechanism should be introduced to ensure the smooth operation of the laws and regulations in this regard. The researchers propose that the law enforcement officers, such as police officers and administrative officers, should be given the necessary training in order to update their performance and the law implementation process should be made free of blinding, corruption, and political influences. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Amarakon, but I will not comment too much on the presentation without the, because of the constraints of time. But I must say this, the presentation was good, but what I find more exciting of the suggestions you have made is the suggestion to regulate behavior of customers on this. <laughs> 
how that is going to be achieved in people, you know. But uh, you know, I can see what you are driving there on that point. And of course, the public private partnership is an important thing. But suggestions are good. I'm sure there will be lots of questions that might be thrown at you around this, especially the challenging uh, proposal of consumers, <laughs> controlling consumers. Uh, that's a major problem, even though a lot of people are worried, they you know, really listen to that. Anyway, thank you very much. That was a good presentation. And um, because of time constraint, I don't want to take too much time because there are question time. I'm sure there are many who will be interested in asking questions. I congratulate you on your present, uh, presentation. And um, we will, with your permission, pass on to the second presentation, which, as I told you before, is by way of a pre recorded video. For the reason that um, this again is the, the work of uh, two authors, S.A.S.P. Hansita and D.P.B. and Karnavarthna. I'm told this Karnavarthna might be making the presentation. Uh, the subject here is again um, uh, quite interesting because it's um, going to make a presentation on the new act, amendment to the Intellectual Property Act, which is 8th of 2021. It was a, it's a great stride in the, in, the, in, the, in the enactment of the law. Uh, concerning the most disabled person. I am sure she'll have the interesting insights into his background, I don't know. The subject, the research paper is theoretical foundation and contemporary application of the concept of social engineering to Intellectual Property Amendment Act number 8 of 2012. It's a very interesting and challenging um, research paper, I believe, uh, from the little I read of the abstract and sure it will be a good presentation might be interesting may i um, request the organizers to play the pre-recorded video i was told hello everyone the attitude of the general public towards disabled people and their rights has undergone a radical change this has mean that it has been possible for lawmakers to confer a large collection of rights on blind and others, the blind and other disabled people. Accordingly, today I would like to present this research on theoretical foundation and contemporary application of the concept of social engineering to intellectual property amendment at number eight of 2021. When I go through my abstract, the main purpose of this article is to explore the possibility of access to intellectual property in the face of the visually impaired community. In addition, to identify and validate the changing nature of copyright and related rights challenges in the age of digitization. It discusses the involvement of the domestic lawmaking mechanism in recent developments in the protection of copyright and related rights in a digital environment to achieve these objectives. Finally, this article seeks to identify gaps in Sri Lankan law and to develop copyright and related rights law to strike a balance between the rights of owners, the general public, and the visually impaired community. This research is a legal inquiry into the inextricable link between law and society through all the theoretical foundation and contemporary application of the concept of social engineering to intellectual property amendment act number 8, 2021. In this in the methodology, this research is normative research, which is primarily based on an extensive literature review as primary sources, international instruments, legislation, and case law such as the Vipo Copyright Treaty of 1996, Vipo Performance and Phonograms Treaty, Intellectual Property Act No. 36 of 2003 and Intellectual Property, Property Amendment Act No. 8 of 2021 in Sri Lanka have been used in this research. Furthermore, journal articles, web resources and textbooks are referred to as secondary sources to enrich the research. When we talk about the Intellectual Property Law, Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights recognizes intellectual property rights as a fundamental right and other rights. 
Accordingly, every person has the right to enjoy the spiritual and physical benefits for scientific, literary, and artistic work created by his own authorship. Furthermore, Article 1 of the first additional protocol to the European Convention on Human Rights and the Bible and Paris Conventions recognized as the great pillars of intellectual property law recognizes intellectual property rights. Various arguments have been made for the justification of intellectual property rights and their security. However, from the perspective of the school of natural law, the creator of intellectual property has always embodied nature, natural rights in his or her intellectual achievement. Therefore, society is morally obligated to present and its steward that property right to him. When we talk about the copyright and publishers, right, copyright is one of the branches of intellectual property law. The primary purpose behind it is to benefit the author through the exclusive legal rights of the individual, which encourages the creation of a more economically aesthetic intellect. By the poor definition, copyright is simply the legal protection granted to the owner of the original work. Section 6.1 of the Intellectual Property Act 2003 states that the concept protects not only original intellectual creations but also derived derivative works as artistic, academic, and scientific works under this act. So, <coughs> when we talk about conflict between intellectual property rights and public wealth, jurisprudence can explain the relationship between intellectual property rights and human rights through two philosophical foundations from a legal point of view. The conflict approach points to the fact that intellectual property rights, which are individual, are constantly in conflict with common social rights. The general opinion is that intellectual property rights limit economic, social and cultural rights. It has become the basis of the conflict approach that it is appropriate to accept the commonwealth concept in any of these conflicts. When we talk about rights of the visually impaired readers community, referring to the Intellectual Property Amendment Act number 8 of 2021, it can be understood that it is intended to facilitate the use of such print media for the visually impaired or those who cannot use the print media due to any visual or physical disability. Research shows that only 1% of works published in developing countries are published in the visually impaired community. The Vipo Control Marrakesh Agreement establishes a set of limitations and exceptions to a traditional copyright law. It facilitates the production and exchange of accessible models specifically adapted for the visually impaired. Accordingly, the Intellectual Property Amendment Act has been introduced to incorporate the Marrakesh Agreement ratified by Sri Lanka in 2016 into the country legal system. Intellectual Property Amendment Act No. 8 of 21 and the Rights of Visually Impaired Readers. In this title, 2021 Amendment Act should balance the conflicting rights between intellectual property rights and the aspirations of society in general. Thus, for those who cannot use the print media due to visual impairment or physical disability, an audio recording of any book can be released for their use. Software is used for this purpose. Furthermore, the amendment states that such audio recordings can convenience the person with special needs mentioned above without any payment. So, finally, I would like to introduce the recommendations and future study requirements. So, the Intellectual Property Amendment Act No. 8 of 2021 further protects the copyright and future expands the access of the entire readership to intellectual creations. At the same time, the new Amendment Act has taken it to another level where it is possible to focus on the right of the entire visually impaired community. The New Amendment Act authorizes the protection of copyrights, copyright rights from third parties for commercial purposes. 
measures must be taken to minimize the violation of those rights in a digital environment. It may be proposed to establish a collective management system on copyright and related rights, which is specifically intended for this purpose. Also, in the examining the legal framework of Sri Lanka, the remedies under Section 170 of the Intellectual Property Act are not sufficient to cover the rights violations that take place in a digital environment. Therefore, the redressal of those rights in digitization must be addressed. Then, a national policy on the intellectual property system should be put into action through a, pra through a practical and efficient mechanism. As a developing country, Sri Lanka should take steps to integrate formal security system into intellectual property systems by providing examples from developed countries. So, we can finally conclude that thus intellectual property law and policymakers have made a positive effort to balance the conflict between public social rights and individual rights through the new amendment act, avoiding the tendency to neglect personal representation for the common good in the making of laws. In Roscoe's statement, the law must be stable, but it must not stand still. The law is a static phenomenon, but it is not static, but realistic that law must change it from time to time. Therefore, we can summarize the above as balancing the conflicting rights and social rights, addressing the fundamental equality and justice, and positively manipulating the rights of the visually impaired. Especially, we would like to acknowledge Mrs. Niluka Damayanti and Mrs. B. A. R. 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 Ratna, who provided the background knowledge on jurisprudence and intellectual property. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kuraratna. The presentation was unfortunately marred by technical glitches. Um, the substance of your presentation is good. In fact, I was waiting to see who was going to speak. Now that it's known that it's Ms. Kuraratna. Ms. Kuraratna, she is a final year student at the Department of Legal Studies, Open University of Sri Lanka. And am she's writing an exam there right now and a medical office in the Sri Lanka Ayurveda Medical Service, and a former visiting lecturer in Dampaha Vikramaraji Ayurveda Institute. She holds a BAMS Honours in Ayurvedic Medicine and Surgery, University of Kalania. Her research areas are gynecology, cosmetology, medical tourism, human rights, and jurisprudence. She did bring into her perspective the question of human rights. Knowledge is a matter of common wealth, and should it be in some way monopolized by under the loss of copyright? Um, it's, a, it's an ancient debate. <laughs> Over the ages, this has been debated, and they have struck a medium by saying, well, the man's copyright, the man, author of the copyright, has to be given some incentive to be right and the fixation of his idea. So they gave him a right, but then you have. The, it has been modified under our law by the question of fair use. Now, this new act, as you pointed out, does enable those who are disabled. I mean, in the form other than the normal visual presentation, maybe braille or whatever it is, you also brought in an interesting thing about digitalization. Now, we have laws in play now with regard to information technology. It has been updated. So, I must congratulate you on your, on your presentation, though it is short. But there is a lot of scope for development of what you have set out in this paper. Maybe we shall see that happening in the near future. I am sure there will be many who will be interested in the subject of providing for disabled people. You know, it has been defined, they have been defined as beneficiary persons in the new act, as it is a takeoff from the Marrakesh Agreement. So we leave the balance excitement of this paper to question time. And um, may I then pass on to our third presentation, which is also, um, I understand, by pre recorded video, I hope without glitches, is going to be presented by the single author, uh, Miss Indika, Miss H.G.T. Indika. She is a, a final year student at 
the Department of Legal Studies Open University, so must be writing a final exam, and Audit Office of the State Audit Service. She holds BSc Business Administration, the University of Yavatanapura. Her research areas are data protection, forensic audit, and performance audit. Now, the subject of her presentation is a review of tobacco taxation and packaging laws in Sri Lanka. So taxation and packaging. Um, parallel areas. Suggestion for development. Now, um, she hopes to identify certain lacunas in the laws concerning this aspect of her presentation, which I am sure she will go and expand in a video presentation. May I please invite the organizers to make that available to the audience? Thank you. I hope I am the son in the student of the Department of Legal Studies, Open University Street. The topic of my research is a review of tobacco taxation and packaging laws in Sri Lanka. Suggestions for development. First, I would like to introduce about the research. Globally, tobacco is the reason for the more than 15% of deaths among men and 7% among women. In Sri Lanka, it is about 10% from the total death per year. We can see tobacco use as cigarette, BDs, and cigar. Cigarette covers 88.3% from the tobacco market in Sri Lanka, BD covers 10%. Silon tobacco from NPSC holds the monopoly of the cigarette infection. Tobacco Tax Act 1999, a National Authority of Tobacco and Alcohol Act, governed the tobacco industry. The objective of this research is to analyze the impact of existing tobacco taxation and packaging laws through tobacco industry factors. Because of the pandemic situation, it couldn't pay for private resources. I consider it as limited. I refer laws and regulations, case laws, international conventions, surveys, articles, and annual report. Now, it is time to discuss about the research and analyzing the risk. When we focus on tobacco consumption and health problems, we can realize around the 20,000 Sri Lanka citizens die every year because of tobacco related health complications. According to the World Health Organization, tobacco attributed death rate is 10% from all other deaths per year in Sri Lanka. The risk of having lung cancers is 95% higher in people who smoke 10 cigarettes in a year. This statement highlights tobacco consumer as age group wise. We can see people who are active in the labor market attributed to smoking. It may strongly affect the labor force of the country. Other hand, that will affect on non smokers by second hand smoking, not only health consequences but also economic consequences.
So in our tobacco company PUC or CPC, operating a subsidiary of British American Tobacco, which owned 84% shares of CPC. This table shows the profitability and cigarette sticks sold to the market by the CPC for last five years. From 2019, it shows decrease in cigarette sticks sold. But profitability decline not that much. According to the CPC, legal sales of cigarettes have declined because of sales of illicit and beads. Bead market has significantly increased. The reason is price hike of legal products. According to the industry research, we can identify annual bead sticks production has increased during the year 
government issued desert notification number 7770-50 with specific regulation introduced pictorial health warnings for the first time in Sri Lanka. By the desert number 1982-33, prohibiting the e-cigarette and flavored sweetened cigarettes. Ceylon Tobacco Company gave the purpose to Minister of Health. This case is landmark case. When the Minister of Health issued the desert notification in 2003, introducing Victoria Mons, stipulating that not less than 80%. CDC filed a written application before the Court of Appeal. CDC argued about their intellectual property right, right to trademark as a legal entity. Court of Appeal gave the decision to balance rights of both parties as 60% for pictorial health warnings and 40% for trademark. It had been appealed to the Supreme Court and the percentage was amended again as 80% and 20%. The amended act was passed in the March 2015. Conclusion and solution. First, I would like to express my observation about government tax policy on tobacco. A regulated tax policy cannot be identified. As I explained before, weed and other tobacco products are still not covered by regulated tax laws. Tobacco companies are passing toll and tobacco tax on the customers. We can identify high price is one of the effective strategy, but it might influence to find alternative skills which might be more dangerous. My suggestions are introducing regulated tobacco tax policy including BD and other tobacco products. Apply equal taxes to all tobacco products may prevent finding alternatives because price are increased in all products in the same time. Government should establish more controls to prevent illicit cigarettes. Then, I am going to discuss about Victoria's warnings and tobacco products. Majority of smokers have apparently seen the government warning in cigarette packages, but it is immature to argue that packaging labeling may no effective in reducing tobacco use prevalence without proper evidence. We can see Victorian warnings and other laws not applied for building My suggestions are there is need of research on whether Victorian warnings are a factor in the decline in cigarette use. There should be identified the most effective method to convey an end user about the government message. Media industry should be governed by this law. Prevention is more important than estimating the loss from the event. An awareness program on smoking cessation can be carried out at the youth community between the age of 15 and 20. It is essential to be aware from the beginning so as not to fall prey to the maturation of the tobacco companies. We industry should be monitored under the law, should be applied not only to cigarette production. It is time that relevant government entities identify and close the loopholes that exist in the legal system that allow me. This is references I used to be with a paper. The, the observations are welcome, but there is one intriguing 
intriguing fact that you have in your final conclusions observation highlighted is the suggestion that um, if the high up with the prices of the tobacco keep increasing, it might push the smokers into <laughs> to find something alternative. I will be interested to know what is the alternative you have in mind. Is it marijuana or something like that? <laughs> I don't know. Or chewing ganja, whatever it is. But you know, those are, it's an interesting thought. But I think you perhaps ought to develop with more time to see or maybe the audience might react to what is the alternative that can be brought in to minimize, you can't stop smoking. Minimize smoking is an aspect, perhaps uh, it never struck me thinking of alternatives. But anyway, thank you very much for your analysis of what is available, what could be done, your observations which are moving forward. Regulations, yes, but it, we are not talking about eradication of it all together. So that, that's a balance that you try to register also what can you do? We are balancing between what is necessary evil and how the evil is to be controlled and otherwise. Anyway, thank you very much for that interesting presentation. I'm sorry the technical aspects of it, some some parts of it can be twice to understand quite clear. Anyway, the paper is good. Thank you so much. It might evoke some questions, especially what the alternative you have in mind. Thank you. And we now come to the fourth paper, which is titled, Do Companies, this is interesting one actually, Do Companies Commit Felonies? Right? A legal analysis on corporate criminal liability, how can companies be guilty of murder? Also of no aside, not the one to murder. The corporate liability, though it's an independent, it's an inanimate body, it is a fiction as though it is recognized as a person is it capable of committing murder. That aspect has been not addressed in Sri Lanka by any legislation. The author, the presenter talks about it, very interesting. That is Miss A.P. Ratnayaka. She is a lecturer, probationary at the Faculty of Law. This is the, not a video presentation, she is a in person. Sri uh, of, of the university. She is an LLB graduate and a lawyer by profession. She holds a Master's of Law degree, specialized in IP and IT law from the United Kingdom. IP is intellectual property and information technology. Further, the author has studied forensic medicine in the University of And um, so let's hear her and how she is going to catch the corporate for murder. Over to you, dear. Ayodhya of the night. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, the topic of my study is Do Companies Commit Felonies? A Legal Analysis on Corporate Criminal Liability. Uh, at the very inception, I would like to talk about the introduction of my study, where it focuses on two main aspects, namely the advantages of company operations to a country and also corporate social responsibility. So having that in mind, let's go to the next uh, slide where the introduction at first discusses about the advantages of company operations. A company normally important to a country uh, which, fa which has already uh, faced the aspects of economic development and already in the process of economic development because it somehow uh, supported in the increasement of the gross domestic production of the country and also it creates many employment opportunities and also by legally it is considered as a separate legal personality. So uh, the corporate social responsibility, if we give a simple definition of corporate social responsibility, it is considered as a concept which guides and directs the specific companies to uh, protect the human rights and also while they are doing the operations they have to avoid the causing of infringement of laws. So companies, their main, uh, their main expectation is profit motive and also they have to balance the etiquettes which have been engrossed in the society for a longer period of time and also 
has to concern on the protection of human rights, basically the right to life and right to existence of the human beings and also the animals. So there should be a balance between the profit motive and the social expectations. So Brandon Williams' contention on the evolution of the corporate social responsibility has been quoted here. According to Brandon Williams, the corporate social responsibility is a judicially evolved concept and also he himself held that the companies owe a duty of care to protect the interests of the public. But this is something controversial to the perceptions which have been held and which have been enshrined by Kelsen and Savitny who, who held that the imposition of liabilities on companies is a big problem, problematic. But that is totally turned out by the very perception of Daniel Williams where he hold the position that concept is judicially evolved and companies should protect the human, uh, protect the interests of the public. So the methodology is, called, is involved with the qualitative analysis of data, specifically involved with doctrinal methodology and it involved with uh, the analysis of both primary and secondary sources of law in case of jurisprudence and also there are they have uh, paid my attention to the domestic and foreign jurisdictions and basically the case law jurisprudence has been uh, very supportive in the comparative uh, analysis because I have used three jurisdictions here, namely India, United Kingdom and United States of America. So United States of America has identified two main grounds on imposing criminal liability on a company. Those two aspects are non-feasance and malfeasance. Non-feasance is an instance where the company is liable in the intentional wrongdoing and malfeasance is an instance where the company is liable in an omission of a foremost obligation to perform. And the landmark case is discussed, New York Central and Hudson River Rail Corporation versus United States, where it states that if we are accepting, exempting, if we are granting exemptions to the companies, that would the granting of exemptions to the company would itself facilitate the companies to circumvent the justice. And as far as the United States of America is concerned, prior to the imposition of a, a criminal liability of a company, uh, the court specifically concerned on the strength of the case, historical record of the misconduct, and also whether the fact whether the company has taken or made any restitution or remedial measures in regard to the misconduct which has incurred. United Kingdom, of course, was of the side that the imposition of corporate criminal liability is imperative for protection of the human rights. And the landmark case Bregnall versus Taylor Limited versus London County Council, a company was held to be guilty for common law offences and also in Hollage case which was decided in 1944 it has been accepted that company can be held liable for statutory offences as well. And one of the great achievements in United Kingdom was the enactment of the Corporate Manslaughter and Corporate Homicide Act in 2007 where it introduced the offence of corporate manslaughter caused by the breach of duty of care by the company. So, as far as the corporate manslaughter is concerned, it basically considers the loss of lives and the infringement of grave infringement of uh, rights by the company operations. So, uh, the act concerns on the harm that inflicts on lives and causing the death of people. So, the primary act 2010, which was enacted in United Kingdom, had the same impact where corporate criminal liability was imposed on the acts of bribery. In India, in Assistant Commissioner versus Bayapa case, which was decided in 2003, the court justified the imposition of criminal liability on companies and also in Standard Chartered Bank versus Directorate of Enforcement Year 2005, it has been accepted the imprisonment can be substituted on behalf of the imposition of a uh, sorry, the impo imposition of a fine can be substituted in lieu of the imprisonment. So, Sri Lanka, I have discussed three aspects companies threatening the public life and environment. They are Ravid Rudhavartana Karyavasan versus Central Environment Authority case, which was decided in 2015, 
and his late uh, late justice uh, Prasanna Jayavarman, his lordship decided the cases and ordered uh, a specific company to give a compensation worth 20 million rupees to the villagers in Chonakkam area due to the fact that their underground water was polluted by the company operations and each householder was entitled to 40,000 rupees by, uh, by the compensation so derived. And also it included the omissions in relation to the safety of the workers where in Horana a rubber factory was in operation and an employee was uh, confronted with the horrendous experience of uh, death by, uh, uh, by falling into a tank containing ammonia waste. So this uh, was considered as one of uh, the grave violation of an obligation on the part of a company which caused the death of a person. And also the contravention of the right to health and life of the public was also considered as one of and that was one of the fact which was of utmost importance and it clearly uh, discussed about the Edna chocolate company case which included uh, the melamine substance in the food products that they have made and melamine was considered as one of uh, poisonous substance which would uh, create uh, so many complications in the urinary and uh, urinary tract and the kidney of the human beings. So I here, here I made three recommendations, that is enactment of a legislation similar to Corporate Manslaughter and Corporate Homicide Act 2007 in United Kingdom. And also I am proposing an amendment to the Article 126 to the Constitution of Sh Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka by including the acts of the private uh, sectors and where the uh, people would be granted uh, access to the Supreme Court for their violation uh, of fundamental rights by the private sector as well and also enhancing the practices of corporate governance in company operations. So as the conclusion, I have stated that the companies established in Sri Lanka do commit crimes against public and the environment and also Sri Lanka does not possess a comprehensive legal framework to address the crimes committed by the companies. These are my references, and thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Ratnayaka. Interesting presentation. Um, you are right, there is no specific legislation in Sri Lanka with regard to, like in UK, for um, homicide and murder and things like that. But I wish to impress upon you or the audience, there is another dimension to your presentation, namely, that the, you refer to the fundamental rights decision of justice, President Jawadna. Um, true, you know, they are in the, the first compensation was awarded, but it is not in the same lines as criminal liability because that's a separate jurisprudential uh, aspect altogether. You will recall that 126, Article 126 of the Constitution enables the Supreme Court to make orders which are just and equitable. It is not like a regular suit in a court of law or a regular suit in a criminal liability action or criminal prosecution. So this is the jurisdiction is widely cast and actually I'm glad you raised it because there has not been, I haven't seen much academic discussion on this aspect of the matter since you highlighted a, a similar statute in Sri Lanka like the English Homicide Act for corporates. So the, the that you, the company was punished by ordering compensation, not only that there was an Northern Power thing also, um, is under the, um, under the jurisdiction, but it's just an equity. In all the circumstances, it was just an equity. I don't think it was based on a criminal liability. You know, criminal liability, when you speak of criminal liability, then you go into the area of criminal law. You know, that is the disparate between the English statute and our civil jurisdiction. Of course, everybody welcomes this, but nobody has really jurisprudentially analyzed whether under cover of justice this can be done. It's because, end of the day, you, as you rightly pointed, I don't want to take too much time to the interesting thing. <laughs> end of the day, it's an inanimate body. It has no men's fear, it has to see us. It's all through human agencies, right? So, are you punishing the people who did it or punishing the corporate act? That, that is why, if you study the Maybe, you know, not for this seminar, but then since you're interested in it, go and study the 
principles of liability that is enshrined in the English Act. You will understand what I am trying to say. It's a good area. Thank you very much for your presentation. And um, let's quickly move on. Or the, if you better develop on this, I mean, we can trust to help you. Yeah, anyway. Uh, uh, we go to the final paper, which is by Ms. Creel. Uh, it's titled Challenges of Law related to indigenous medical research for drug innovation in Sri Lanka in the context of the new normal particular analysis that is um, indigenous drug innovation that's interesting because there you're probably thinking of the COVID thing and of course I think I saw it in the yesterday even in Syria and the white has now come down with COVID so it was preferring indigenous medication it's interesting a uh, word about our um, presenter, Ms. Kiviela. Anuradhi Kiviela was a government servant at the Judicial Service Commission of Sri Lanka from 1997 to 2004. She was called to the bar in 2007 and working at works as an attorney at law in private practice. She is a life member of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka. She holds a diploma in forensic medicine granted by the Department of Forensic Medicine in the Faculty of Medicine of Peradenia in 2018. She is studying Master of Laws at the Defense University of Tlaoula. So, uh, well, the objective of the study, she has said, is to find reason for the controversial issues occurring when traditional cures were introduced to Sri Lanka. Let's hear what she has to say. Over to you, Ms. Kiria. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Hello, am I audible? Yes, yes. And uh, the presenters uh, and the participants. Uh, now, uh, I'm going to uh, present the findings of my research and challenges of law related to, in, uh, related to indigenous indigenous, uh, indigenous medical research for drug innovation in Sri Lanka in the context of new normal uh, critical analysis. The uh, outline of my research consists of introduction, objectives, discussion, conclusion and recommendations uh, future avenues and the differences. Yes. Uh, with the prevailing condition of the world, the World Health Organization activated a blueprint of research and development on uh, therapeutics for COVID-19 since uh, it is a virus it is not cured by any available drug in the world. Uh, at a, the WHO attention uh, drawn not only on the allopathic medicine but also indigenous medicine which is limited to the South African region. I formulated a research problem uh, what are the weaknesses to loopholes of low, low on drug innovation of indigenous or traditional medicine in Sri Lanka? After I show the video that contains this picture, picture since there is uh, persons who are who are introduced the syrup or kiosk who are not the registered diabetic practitioners. Therefore, finding out why finding out why this happened so is become an urgent in the law. I used uh, systematic literature review to identify the relevant areas uh, of law and analysis to answer the research questions that what are the relevant source and uh, defects of the laws, uh, how to adapt all indigenous practitioners to one formula regarding 
regarding the dark innovation of traditional medicine and what are the uh, authorized, authorized bodies have responsible for the drug innovation of indigenous or traditional medicine in Sri Lanka. When I started to conduct my research, I identified that the Ayurvedic and Nanda Gari of 1961 as a final legislation and gas notification issued under section 18 uh, regulation and regulation issues issued under section 82 of the Ayurveda Act. In addition to that, I taken into consideration the National Medicine Regulatory Authority Act No. 5 of 2015 and Extraordinary Gasset Issue under Section 152 and uh, Intellectual Property Act No. 36 of 2003, State Industrial Cooperation Act No. 49 of 1957 and National Research Council of Sri Lanka Act No. 11 of 2016. When we peruse the RAD Act carefully, the RAD Medical Council established under Section 11 for the registration of persons as RAD practitioners, among other things, provided by the Section 18. According to Section 16, the quorum of the RAD Medical Council is 6. The subsection 3 of Section 69 provides that uh, practicing as an Ayurvedic practitioner without registration is an office. However, according to section 111F1, the Ayurvedic Medical Council shall contain for not more than three persons who are not registered Ayurvedic practitioners appointed by the minister. It is an exclusive admission. Means it is impossible to both these sections to exist or function together. In addition to that, Ayurvedic Medical Council may refuse the registrations of practitioners on the ground that he has been convicted by competent court of, of competent, competent court of any offence which shows him to be unfit to be such practitioner. The words of any offence in this section subjected to phrase which she shows him to be unfit to be such practitioner. The act does not mention what are the offences unfit to be such practitioner. Therefore, it is totally dependent on the discussion of the members of the Ayurvedic Medical Council. Here my argument is that the provisions regarding the registration of traditional medical practitioners especially should be specific and strong means to avoid the circumstances arose which we are witness to the last few months. And the Ayurvedic Drug Corporation established under State Industry Corporation Act, but there is no any provisions with regard to this issue. The next law is uh, National Medicine Regulatory Authority Act, which is based on the establishment of National Medicine Regulatory Authority Sri Lanka. This is very comprehensive law which is uh, which regard, regulates the whole areas regarding the medicine and uh, therapeutic goods uh, in, including uh, domestic produce as well as imported. The medicine is interpreted in section 104, 106 uh, but does not include an Ayurvedic medicine or homeopathic medicine that is expressly excluded. The most important law is Intellectual Property Act enacted to protect the intellectual property rights of the people. Uh, there is no uh, direct provision regarding the uh, medicine, medical knowledge, traditional medical knowledge in Sri Lanka. However, expression of photo protected by section 24 uh, the expression of folklore uh, interpreted in section 5, according to this section, the traditional or indigenous medical knowledge could not be put into include or include into the meaning of expression of folklore. The next one is National Research Council of Sri Lanka. The National Research Council established under section 2 of this act 
to assist the government to facilitate research relating to technical and uh, science and technology in order to build a viable scientific and technological community in the country and uh, to promote the promote and facilitate research relating to science and technology in higher education institutions and public sector research institutions and other governmental institutions so as to develop a research base that will contribute to national needs at finland researchers in public sector who are willing to do the research in science and technology therefore no many who the traditional medical practitioners to conduct their research even under this set my recommendations are to preserve tradition traditional medicine uh, changing or making laws uh, needs to be executed accordingly the practitioners of traditional medicine must be adapted to the proper legal framework we are protecting their uh, intellectual property rights for that purpose the ayurved act number 31 of 1961 which is older more than 50 years must be amended in line with the present requirement and as much as possible for the future with the effect of effect to the intellectual property act they have to act as sri lankan traditional medicine will be able to achieve full recognition of the world health organization even in with the implementation of the who strategies which is already provided and uh, achieve the pathways to trade benefits even the world even in the world market the introduce research methodology and provide the research accept, accepted research criteria is necessary for traditional medical practitioners as may many researchers reveal that the notion of time tested is not more valid it would be more effective if the legislature could bring a new bill that uh, containing similar provisions to the national medical medicine regulatory authority act with regard to the traditional medicine in sri lanka thank you So innovation um, using traditional knowledge, uh, the government's innovation in the IT act or area which are problematical. But what was important is I think what requires immediate attention is your complaint about the word definition, uh, the offence, which is uh, so so fluid that uh, you can have uh, problems over that. I don't know in, how in practice it has worked. Uh, anyway, that's an area that perhaps needs immediate attention to protect the uh, disqualification of the uh, practitioner. Anyway, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, and uh, now we are, I know we have run out of, run out of time. Now, um, thank you very much for the presentation. Now we can move on to question and answer session. Um, um, so, um, do, do we have uh, questions arising from any of the presentation from the audio audience, please? Hello. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, yes. Mr. I am Dr. Yes. Rodrigo. Yes. Doctor, anybody? Um, I don't know whether there are any questions or yeah. observation uh, time. Yeah, just exceeded our time, I guess. Good morning, good morning, Mr. Kanagi's Varan. I'm Dr. Roger. Yes. I have a question to ask from the fourth president, Ms. Ayodhya Ratnayaka. Yes. Uh, her paper is very interesting. Uh, do companies uh, commit challenge a legal analysis? on corporate criminal act, uh, as she correctly said, it's true that 
uh, as the law stands today, there is no law, uh, you know, to uh, govern this aspect of law. But uh, we must say that the judges can exert influence on the uh, legislators to make law, as they have done in many other fields. Now, if you take, for example, now I think Justice Prasanna uh, Jawad had done that within the powers he had under Article 126 by awarding damages in a fundamental rights case. I think uh, that could have influenced the legislators. I, I don't know how they took it. Uh, similarly, you know, in other fields also, like you know, if you take uh, exemption clauses in the law of contract, you know, Justice uh, uh, Denning, as he was, and in Carsell's limited case, you know, he tried to, uh, you know, invent a rule called the fundamental, the fundamental breach of duty, which uh, the when he, you know, came up before the House of Lords in Securico uh, company case. Right? Uh, they are, the House of Lords said, we judges have no power to make law. Right? What we should do is, you know, we should, in our task of interpreting law, we should try to give the maximum uh, relief to the agreed part. So in that case, you know, they said, we can start with the presumption that the parties do not intend to exclude their liability. And therefore, it imposes such, such, a, such, a, such a presumption, imposes a very strong, you know, uh, you know, burden of proof on the uh, on the defendant, on the defendant to uh, you know rebut that presumption. Like that, you know, in this case also, I think the burden possible. Otherwise, you know, the judges can't refuse to hear case, although they have a hard case, right? Now, for example, in English schools, you have studied uh, Ronald Walking, Ronald Walking, in his uh, concept, in his theory of integrity of law, integrity of law, moral integrity of law, he says that there is the correct answer in the community. For every problem, you know, there is a the correct answer. The problem is to, you know, uh, to uh, discover. So the duty of the judges by using their skills, you know, their knowledge, skills, and also attitudes, they must try to, as Honorable uh, Justice Jawad, uh, Prasad Jawadana has done, they must make every effort to uh, discover this uh, principle, which is the lacuna in the system. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Well, you uh, is Ratnak, are you answering that, or can you answer that, or is that? <laughs> you have been invited to expand on your research and come up with a draft of the law. Is it wrong time? Uh, long time, yes. Oh, I, I, was <laughs> yeah. so, I was glad to see you. I was to see you. Are there any other questions? Are you ah, yes, uh, Rajiv, yeah, I, I have one question. Um, yes. It will be interesting oh, to uh, Rajiv, I'm sorry. Ah, Rajiv, yes. Uh, uh, it will be interesting presentation of the fourth one, which do a lot of interest with the sort of views, limit rights, and then, of course, the criminal rights which will be for populace. And yeah. uh, as you know, the fundamental rights jurisdiction, of course, present is limited to under Article 126, where uh, it even happens instead. <laughs> Is it practical, my question is, is it practical to widen the, the, the scope of Article 126 to cover, uh, say, private conduct? Or is, it, or is it more practical to look at some kind of legislation, like in the case of, say, say you cite in England and then there? Or is it, is it a hybrid which, which, which you would recommend for, to address this issue? You're asking me or ask I'm asking the presenters are presenters. Right. <laughs> That's an important question. Uh, I'm proposing both on the fact that uh, I think the people, uh, they must have the access to the superior court, the apex court of the country, in an event of uh, violation of the, uh, fundamental rights. And also uh, the enactment of a simultaneously powerful legislation 
is of utmost importance. So I think uh, as the legal system of Sri Lanka is uh, developing, and I think uh, if we can resort to both the recommendations that we provide the best for the law and the developing uh, legal arena of the country. And as far as uh, Article 126 is concerned, and particularly concerning on the people uh, or the citizens of the country who must have their unimpeded access to the superior court without any impediment and proposing on that. Thank you. Thank you. And in this fall, I see because um, the 126 jurisdiction is an uncontrolled jurisdiction. You know? And if I know it is a quick remedy, you can go straight to that court. But when you come to criminal liability, and that means it's a civil aspect of it, criminal liability, we are talking about that. There must be norms, there must be liability principles established before you can finally be left to the human fancy of the judge's own personal opinion. You should have done that. It's a bit dangerous method, I think, um, because uh, when you are attaching liability, criminalism, we are talking about criminal liability in civil proceedings. You know, under the ICC, there is no investigation, there is no, both sides are not, you know, I mean, most of them are affidavit, this paper report. I don't think, anyway, give the thought, I am not saying it's not good, but if you are going to do it, it has to be very, very carefully structured. As the questions are true, I can, you can come in, you get, uh, you can blow a lot of hot air in front of the lights and get leaves. So that is a dangerous thing if you are going to attack criminal activity, because, uh, anyway. That can be your researching that look you have to balance it both ways, right? There is also no appeal. There is also no appeal. No appeal. Just one stop shop. One stop shop. And it's a good paper, good area you have got a slightly for what I would call hitherto virgin area and faculty right on the university has touched on this. It's a thing which has interested me and you work on it. But Rajiv Price is an important thing. <laughs> Sorry, um, there must be other questions, I'm sure. Uh, sir, I'm Mahesh Abhinayaka. Yes. Uh, I have a question, sir, for oh, Ayodhya Abhinayaka. Ayodhya, uh, uh, yes. Yes, uh, there is uh, the research related to the corporate, uh, the government's corporate social responsibility concerning the companies. I would add that uh, your uh, research, uh, you, you mentioned your research is based on a uh, qualitative research approach. Why you are not selected uh, the mixed method? Because there are the many uh, the companies in Sri Lanka, public listed, private companies. There are many the cases like Aetna, Chocolates, and uh, that is why you are not based on uh, the qualitative, uh, uh, the mixed method, the qualitative and the quantitative mixed method. Can you briefly explain about why you are not doing? No, sir. The basic reason is because in this research I'm proposing to lay, uh, I'm taking lessons from a comparative jurisdiction and I'm proposing to enact a simultaneous in a legislation in Sri Lanka. So for the time being, I thought that adapting qualitative content analysis would be of imperative concern than resorting to a mixed method uh, methodology, uh, mixed methodology by adapting both qualitative and quantitative ones. So I thought uh, for the time being. As I'm proposing the enactment of a separate legislation, uh, the doctrinal methodology, comparative analysis, uh, and also uh, the content analysis of the materials would be enough, I thought. <laughs> ah, very good. How will you research it as the excellent area? And that's very important area in the current practice. Okay, thank you, Yavidya. I'm sure there must be some questions on other papers as well. How about the tobacco paper? Alternative, <laughs> alternative to smoking. Rajiv, you have no observations on that. <laughs> I think interesting paper that also was. I think the, the interesting point was that the the, the stick sales have reduced. Uh, the revenue has not, and obviously the, the tobacco companies have found a way to uh, keep the revenue streams coming. 
And of course, I think, as I think you mentioned that it's, it's a toss up because even the government is on one hand, it, it's an important revenue source. So maybe we can put the question to the presenters to how now over the years, the governments have been reliant on excise duties on tobacco and alcohol. And that is a vicious cycle because obviously that is important for, I mean, especially given our situation now, uh, how does one get away from this, this vicious cycle of, uh, on one hand, the government's being extremely dependent on this revenue. And of course, then there's a social cost also. So how do you break this cycle and 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 obviously through taxation are the measures and we move towards a different different uh, realm so, so to speak i think the presenter yeah. is uh, made a video she is writing an exam i am told yes. i don't know whether okay. she so, so, yes, yes, we, were, we were informed so, but that's an interesting i don't know that's something yeah which, i know it's an interesting we we'll never yeah. never get over yes i, I think she is uh, Well, um, there aren't any questions. Uh, looks like this university audience for lunch very early, yeah? Well, <laughs> bar association <laughs> seminars go on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, time management is very orderly, I think, with the military involvement also, the discipline, <laughs> time. Who is... Um, Closing the session, or I don't know. I mean, is anybody else doing it, or do we stop here? Or I know we pass the time, half past eleven. Anybody Sir, else organize? Can you please uh, yes, come on to session? Sorry. Sir, you are requested to come up to session. Sorry, I didn't get that. I am. I'll close the session. I, I think they want you to sum up, sum up the ses session, sir. Oh, oh, sum up the session. Oh, well, I must say that all the presentations were good. As you see, the fourth paper on on corporate criminal liability has evoked, appears to have evoked more interest. But I found that the, the presentation on um, the Ayurvedic um, innovation, indigenous medicine innovation protection laws also important because um, um, there is a... Um, as he rightly pointed out, under intellectual property, these things cannot be patented or, you know, but because on the base of, uh, that's why they exclude us specifically from folklore. We don't have a provision for traditional knowledge, but it might come under that. So how do we then uh, encourage uh, innovation? You know, when you speak of innovation, then you are going into the law related to patent. Uh, then if you are using the same all um, indigenous um, herbs and um, medicinal plants, then are you coming up with something new? You know, we had the case of Samahan, which used traditional uh, herbs and um, and plants and came up with a payava, which was instantly soluble. You know, that was, though it was not patented uh, for various reasons because the secret process, now that was innovation like that. So, or they uh, should they be addressed? Or the problem with traditional knowledge is that it should not be to get a patent or something like that. You are actually claiming a monopoly. So it's an area which needs to be. How do you help with the indigenous uh, medicine practitioners in helping them to come up with innovations? It's some protection that they might be given. It's an area I think the present uh, probably. Um, had in mind in making the presentation. Um, then tobacco, of course, the problem we already discussed. Social engineering, intellectual property, yeah, that was uh, our compliance with Marrakesh Agreement. It's going to, because now recent times, we have had several um, uh, provisions with regard to uh, disabled, handicapped people. You know, most of the hotels now have to have that, um, um, what do you call that? Um, uh, no steps and you should be able to permit them to access and things like that. There was one particular doctor, I followed his name, who was very much in the forefront of this. I knew him when I was a younger man. Uh, that was also, then we have the, um, the sustainable development, you know, COVID presented by Ms. Samaragon. That was the first paper. Um, well, all in all, 
I am surprised there are no more, no more questions which coming in. But um, I think it was a very good session and um, kept to the, the session is novel trends emerging and new thoughts on existing old subject. I think in the, all the all the presentation, except for the technical glitch here and there on the unfortunately recorded videos. Um, other than that, I, am, I must say all the papers were good and uh, audience reaction. Usually, of course, our people are very shy in asking questions. I know that. Uh, but even with that, I am sure there was so much food for thought among the students. I don't know how many participants there are. Um, how much would have been quite um, encouraging to them and exciting also. So I must congratulate the organizers for having chosen this topic for this session so so titled as Novel Trends Emanating from the New Normal, because that is the matter for discussion the world over, New Normal both positive and negative and positive and negative aspects are there from the children's point of view or from nurses point of view, doctors and things like that, for um, health workers, the frontline workers and things like that. So I must congratulate um, the organizers and um, um, Dr. Yasoda Vijayaratna, I think who might have been in the forefront of this. They've been chasing me, keeping me on my toes to be on time. I don't know whether I should have worn a jacket, but I wasn't too sure. Anyway, if I did not do, forgive me. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vijayaratna and others involved in this. And may I hand those sessions to you? So we have just a few minutes over shot. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, sir. So thank you. Uh, I thank everyone for the invaluable contribution. Our computer will conclude the session. Thank you very thank much, you. sir. It has indeed been a thought-provoking, enriching session. I would like to thank the Honorable Chairperson and all the paper presenters for their esteemed presence here at this session. Ladies and gentlemen, with that, we conclude the second technical session. Technical session three of the day will be commencing at 1 p.m. Kindly use the same link to join the session.